Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Easing the Lockdown Challenges for Employers, Remote and On-Site Working. This session is one of a series of interactive webinars hosted by Phil Fisher's Employment, Pensions, Immigration and Compliance Team, also known by the handy acronym of EPIC. We will be hosting a 30-minute session every Tuesday at 1 p.m., covering significant legal developments, hot topics, and offering practical advice for businesses and organizations in this ever-changing environment. I would like to start by introducing myself and my fellow presenter. My name is Alex Watson. I am a director in the Manchester Employment Team. I advise medium and large UK and European employers with particular focus on hospitality, retail and manufacture and specialise in compliance and business planning. And my name is genuinely Richard Branson and I'm an associate in Alex's team in Manchester. I advise private sector clients on all aspects of the employment relationship in both contentious and non-contentious matters across a number of sectors, including financial services, transport, retail and energy. Thanks, Alex. OK, thank you, Rich. So it goes without saying, so I will say it, that these are difficult times for employers and organisations of different sectors, size and location will be impacted differently. Today's webinar will cover very briefly in our 30 minute time slot some of the current business planning challenges facing employers with the government's plan for the phased lifting of lockdown and closure of the coronavirus job retention scheme looming on the horizon. So in today's session, we will be covering returning to work, specifically the practicalities of transitioning out of furlough, health and safety obligations and operational return to work conditions and managing employee risks and concerns and remote working, ensuring employee well-being and how to manage performance in these circumstances. If you have any questions, please use the question box on your control panel on the right hand side of the screen and we will aim to get through as many as possible. If we don't get time to answer all the questions, we will follow up with you individually. All the sessions are recorded, recorded and available on the Field Fisher website and YouTube channel. So let's get started. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Richard. OK. Whilst the implementation of the job retention scheme and working from home has been a challenge, this has broadly been assisted by workers' willingness to engage in order to protect pay and health. However, as businesses prepare for life after lockdown, this will raise a number of operational, commercial and legal challenges that may have been deferred by the implementation of these schemes. As you'll be aware, the job retention scheme has now been extended until October 2020, albeit that from August 2020, two key changes will come into effect. Firstly, the ability for employers to bring back workers on a part-time basis or basis while still receiving wage grants, but a requirement for organisations to bear at least some of this cost by contributing a percentage of pay to make up the £2,500 per month or 80%. The details of these changes and the extent of the contributions are due to be provided by the government at the end of May 2020. But in the meantime, the government has now announced its three-step plan to lift lockdown measures with ambitions for shops, public events, pubs and hospitality to reopen between May and July in this year. Employers are now beginning to put in place plans for the return of some or all of their workforce during this period. And naturally, this will lead to some challenges. The spectre of life after lockdown raises numerous questions for businesses and organisations across the UK and Europe. Some of the most commonly asked questions we're seeing at the moment are set out on the slide. Unfortunately, with a limited time frame, we can't hope to cover all of these topics in significant detail, but you'll see from our schedule of webinars that some of these topics will be covered in more detail in coming weeks, in particular, redundancy, privacy and testing and cyber harassment, or as Richard says, we're happy to pick up any queries offline after the webinar if we can't get to your question today. Instead, we're going to pick up some of the key initial questions and considerations for employers coming out of lockdown or returning from home working. So firstly, possibly the most practical issue, when and how to bring employees back from furlough. So businesses, lawyers and the government have been working out the practicalities of furlough throughout the lifetime of the scheme. One of the key questions now facing employers is how do we bring back all or part of our workforce? Do we need to give notice to workers? And if so, how much notice do we need to give them? What if they refuse to come back? The starting point will be to review the communications with workers. And it's a requirement of the scheme for employers to have confirmed to workers in writing that they've been placed on furlough. It's been common practice for a number of employers for workers to have entered into a furlough agreement when they were placed on furlough. 
and this agreement may contain details as to how furlough will be ended and employees must comply with the terms set out in that agreement to avoid breaches of contract or complaints. If no such agreement was issued, or no guidance was given to employees on how furlough will end, which isn't uncommon at all, then employers will need to consider whether notice needs to be given to require the employees to return. Now, practically, we take the view that it's likely that notification that a worker needs to return from furlough will be a reasonable management instruction without set obligations to provide minimum periods of notice. However, this will still be subject to the ongoing terms of trust and confidence between an employer and employee. So consideration will need to be given to the personal circumstances of individuals, for example, such as childcare commitments or transport. And employers would therefore be prudent to notify workers as far in advance as possible to minimise any of these risks and to manage any concerns prior to the return to work, for example, for vulnerable employees concerned about health and safety or social distancing. As with all staff communications during this period, clear communication with workers will be key. At the same time as planning when workers will return to site, consideration, which Richard will cover in this webinar, should also be given steps that may be taken to protect workers on site. If so, it would be wise to communicate these measures early and transparently to the workforce, ideally at the same time as informing them when they will be needed to return. So what about one of the most thorny issues? What about part of the workforce returning? Well, Unfortunately, it's likely that for many organisations, things will return to normality slowly, with some employers only requiring a proportion of their employees to return to site once permitted. This raises new challenges for employers, which are likely to be business dependent. Now, this may raise some tricky decisions for employers. Let's assume you only need 20 out of 40 widget producers to return to your widget factory. How should the 20 workers be selected? The answer to this question is likely to vary depending on the individual circumstances of an organisation, but key principles will need to be kept in mind when doing so. Employees retain unfair dismissal rights and all workers are covered by the Equality Act. So care will need to be taken to avoid accidentally exposing an employer to risk, for example, by making assumptions about older workers or workers sickness and ensuring that this aspect is handled fairly to avoid employment claim risks. In doing so, in making these arrangements, it's key that employers should ensure that there's sound business logic, which is fair to employees when considering about the phasing of who returns and when. This might include seeking volunteers to remain on furlough or potentially unpaid leave beyond October 2020 if the scheme comes to an end. It could involve rotating shift patterns to evenly spread absence from the business. It could include part-time working from August or a selection of processes similar to a redundancy situation. In advance of putting these measures in place, employers should also consider issues that may arise. So for example, is commuting likely to be an issue for a significant part of the workforce? Have any workers expressed significant or specific concerns? Because this is a business risk issue, not simply an HR task. Ideally, a project leader could be appointed with a dedicated team involving the people who have appropriate accountabilities. One perhaps seemingly obvious question will be, well, what happens to employees' pay when they return from furlough? Well, unless alternative arrangements have been agreed, once workers return, employers should automatically continue to pay 100% of the pay that workers are contractually entitled to prior to a furlough period. Now, this may cause issues where employers want to reduce pay due to economic considerations. And there are several methods of achieving this, for example, by individual consent through collective agreement, uh, employers may decide to unilaterally make the change or they could force the change through consultation. But as these changes are going to relate to potentially longer term changes in pay, it's much more likely to require a longer lead in time and significantly more planning. One of the other hot topics and challenges that we anticipate that employers will face will be, well, what happens if workers fail to return or they refuse to return from to work? So one of these challenges will be cases where workers refuse to return to work at the end of a period of furlough or from home working arrangements. And in normal pre-COVID circumstances, this question might seem simple, but particularly in the transition phases of lifting lockdown, there is greater risk for employers taking an overly robust stance. People may have seen in the past 24 hours, mainstream media coverage of employees who have been threatened with dismissal by their employers in such circumstances. 
So besides the PR risks, this also carries a greater legal risk. Let's take, for example, an employee refusing to return to work because a member of their family is shielding or vulnerable, or where the refusal is based upon a belief that insufficient health and safety measures have been implemented by their employer. Whilst the employee may not be justified in those beliefs, these are circumstances where greater employment risks will be present. For example, in dis disability discrimination, whistleblowing disclosures or protected disclosures about health and safety concerns. And employers must be alive to these potential risks in the communication and handling of workers uh, returning to site. Now, at the same time as some of these immediate practical considerations, this is also an appropriate time to be planning for the longer term uh, business needs. In particular, uh, after the immediate return to on-site working, the lifting of lockdown is also the sensible time to consider planning issues, whether in relation to contractual terms, workforce pay, uh, it may be in relation to restructures or redundancy, and particularly for employers currently utilising the current job retention scheme. Now, in, in particular, what impact will the closure of the scheme have on cash flow? Is it appropriate to consider alternative short-time working and layoff options? And if so, is there a contractual right for employers to do so with their staff? Because if not, are these contractual provisions that the organisation should look to incorporate before the scheme closes later this year? Importantly, and we'll touch upon this in next week's webinar on redundancies, there's nothing in the job retention scheme, the government guidance or the COVID-19 Act, which has changed the existing law on redundancies. This remains the same. The only thing that's new or is different is in its application. There are potentially two aspects, depending on how many redundancy dismissals are being proposed. Tribunals will expect to see a fair and objective process being carried out before final decisions are taken as to decide which employees are made redundant. And before any decisions are taken about individuals, employers will have to understand, sorry, the individuals will have to understand that they're at risk, understand why they're at risk, have the opportunity to put forward ideas for avoiding redundancy, and all of these aspects will need to be explored. This will usually take at least two meetings to have those discussions, and in the current circumstances where it may not be possible to have those meetings face-to-face, -face, alternative arrangements such as telephone meetings, um, Zoom calls may be the most appropriate way of doing this, which raises its own challenges. It's also worth bearing in mind that if numbers are such, um, then collective consultation may also be triggered. This will occur where the employer is proposing to dismiss as redundant 20 or more employees at one establishment, for example, a particular site or workplace within a period of 90 days or less. An extremely important point to bear in mind with collective consultation is that there is an additional obligation to serve an HR form to the government. This sets out that a group of people are at risk of redundancy and potentially carries a criminal offence if it's not done in time. So in summary, there's nothing new about the current furlough scheme, which will uh, will allow employers to take shortcuts when it comes to making redundancies. It will simply mean that there are further obstacles and hurdles about the processes which will need to be put in place. And Richard will now talk about one of the most important aspects to consider in returning to site in relation to health and safety. Thank you, Alex. So, as employers work through plans to return, there are likely to be a number of health and safety considerations, and the use of simple risk assessments will help to eliminate or reduce a lot of the risks. Workers will expect enhanced health and safety measures when they return to the workplace, including greater availability of hand sanitizers and encouragement to use them, and deep cleans of their workspaces. You may have seen that the government has recently published new COVID-19 secure guidelines, which provide practical guidance on how to ensure workplaces are as safe as possible. While these guidelines do not supersede any legal obligations, employers should be taking them into account. But it's also important to note that the guidance relates to England only. Given the variations in legal requirements across jurisdictions, multinational employers will need to tailor uh, approaches for each location. The guidelines focus on five key points which should be implemented as soon as it is practical. The first point is for employees to work from home where possible. The second is to carry out a COVID-19 risk assessment. Point three is to maintain two metres social distancing wherever possible. Point four provides that where people cannot be two metres apart, employers need to ma manage transmission risk. This may be done by putting barriers in shared spaces, 
creating workplace shift patterns of fixed teams, minimizing the number of people in contact with one another, or ensuring colleagues are facing away from each other. The guidance also goes on to suggest that where social distancing cannot be maintained, employers should think about whether the activity being carried out is essential. And the final point is to reinforce cleaning processes. So as I said, workplaces should be cleaned more frequently, paying close attention to high contact objects such as door handles and keyboards, and employers should provide hand washing facilities or hand sanitizers at entry and exit points. When it comes to carrying out risk assessments, employers need to consider the risks in the workplace and the way in which it operates, including how the risk can be avoided, whether that is asking employees to work at home, to work flexible hours, or by implementing the measures just mentioned. This may require employers to redesign workspaces to maintain the two meter distances between people, such as by staggering start times, creating one-way walkthroughs, opening more entrances and exits, or changing seating layouts in break rooms and other communal areas. Consideration should also be given to limiting the number of employees in confined spaces away from the workstation, such as elevators and communal areas. Where workers travel for work, this obligation may extend to their travel arrangements, for example, limiting the number of individuals in a company vehicle. Effective planning is going to be required to ensure that these adjustments can be integrated smoothly. For example, limiting numbers using lifts, stairwells or communal areas may create log jams at either end of the working day if not implemented in a considered manner. It's important to consult and involve employees in the risk assessment process and this should be done in consultation with workers or trade unions to establish what guidelines to put in place. We've already seen um, very vocal unions in the teaching and transport sector so we can expect other unions to be in the press about this very soon. Um, Employers should consult with employees about the steps that they are taking to manage the risk of COVID-19, the changes they are planning to ensure work is done safely and the practicalities of returning to work. It's also important to listen to what employees are saying to be proactive in addressing their concerns. For one, having good open employee engagement and consultation will reduce the likelihood of any whistleblowing scenarios. The government has indicated that it expects all employers with over 50 workers to publish the results of their risk assessments on their website. Now, this is not a legal requirement and could carry some risks such as unwanted press and social media attention. So employers should consider whether to simply share the risk assessments internally for now. The situation is ever evolving and risk assessments should be continuously reviewed. One important category of worker in this regard is extremely clinically vulnerable people who have been advised to shield because they are likely to experience the effect of the virus more severely than others. Returning to the workplace uh, would likely put them in danger of contracted COVID-19, which could carry personal injury risks or even fatal consequences. So refusing to come back to work is more likely to be reasonable because of their status as an extremely vulnerable person. Employers should try to avoid bringing such staff back to work if possible. Furlough may be an option or otherwise taking all reasonable steps to facilitate working from home. If it's not possible to work from home, these employees will be entitled to SSP and potentially company sick pay. If, on the other hand, the employee themselves does not believe it is unsafe to return to work, this may give rise to a claim for unlawful detriment. So you need to be very careful when assessing extremely clinical vulnerable employees. Vulnerable people, on the other hand, have not been advised to shield, but it is still recognised that they may, may be at greater risk from contracting the virus and may wish to continue to shield. They can attend work if it is safe to do so, but employers should conduct a risk assessment and ask for occupational health input or even medical guidance from the employee's GP. Vulnerable people are not entitled to SSP or company sick pay, but could, again, potentially claim unlawful detriment in such circumstances. Care needs to be taken again when assessing whether they can return to work. In addition, in the UK, the Equality Act provides additional protection for employees who are classified as disabled, including that reasonable adjustments should be made in certain circumstances so as to avoid any substantial disadvantage. Employees should therefore proceed with caution, ensuring that more vulnerable employees are adequately protected. The government has, has suggested that employees could offer 
both vulnerable and extremely clinically vulnerable employees different roles where this may facilitate a safer working environment. Reasonable adjustments should also be made for pregnant employees to ensure that it's safe for them to, to return to work. If these adjustments cannot be made, then these employees are entitled to be paid in full until the commencement of their maternity leave. In terms of how to deal with employees who want to shield at home because they live with vulnerable people, this will depend on the circumstances, but an employer may need to allow this in the short term, especially if there's no other way of avoiding the danger to the vulnerable person. If that employee is subject to a detriment, for example, not being paid and or dismissal because they refuse to turn to work, then there is potential risks of claims for both unlawful detriment and unfair dismissal. Employees will need to ensure that COVID-19 policies and procedures and risk assessments are robust before the resumption of work in the workplace, ensuring the safety of workers and others visiting the premises. For example, questions to consider are, what will happen if an employee falls sick whilst at work? What if an employee does not disclose that a member of their household is suffering from COVID-19? What should be the best practices for protecting employees whilst maintaining a continuity of operations? Clear policies should be established addressing these issues and employees should clearly understand what these new policies and practices are. This may even require training of managers and other staff. Lastly, thought should be given as to how breaches of these policies should be treated and with what level of severity. Given that there's no precedent for a rule on social distancing, employees need to communicate the need for these measures and explain why, focusing on the real need for these behaviours, such as keeping one another safe. It's not sensible just telling people, congregate at the kitchen area and you'll be disciplined. It's the reason why that matters most, and any sanctions imposed should be proportionate and consistent across the workforce. Back to you, Alex. Struggling with my mute button there. Thanks very much, Richard. Nothing like some cheery health and safety at lunchtime. Um, so clearly there are gonna be some challenges but the vast majority of people are eager to return to work. So in order to facilitate a smooth return to work, there are some practical tips that employers can adopt. First and foremost, planning. Although very difficult to forecast conditions for the coming months and year, employers planning ahead and putting in place potential measures or workforce plans will find it much easier to implement these. Whether practical staffing issues, allowing ample time to communicate and get buy-in from employees, or the difficult step of preparing for redundancies or other major changes, the most prepared employers will see less risk. Um, we will constantly talk about this, but communication remains key. These are difficult times, obviously, both for businesses and individuals, but we're seeing the greatest success in those businesses that communicate regularly, clearly, and transparently, even when they're making it clear to employees that they don't know what the future holds, and that they're working with uh, the guidance that's available to them at the time. Speak to employees about any concerns they have about the return to work and keep in regular contact, uh, whether working from home or on site. In advance of any moves after lockdown to return to site, give training to employees where possible, whether on social distancing in the workplace and some of the practical steps that Richard suggested, on using PPE equipment if required, or in any new working practices. This will help to give reassurance, but will also demonstrate to the workers that these are points which we're taking seriously. Create a formal process so that employees can raise concerns about health and safety in the workplace, ideally separate to the whistleblowing procedure. And it may also be useful to have a team dedicated to planning and phasing a return to work and monitoring government guidance and employee concerns where appropriate, like a working group. Employers should carry out and implement risk assessments, give employees notice and assistance in returning to work, but finally, um, be creative and flexible. These are challenging times for individuals and businesses alike. And whilst there may be concerns on risk, which we talk about in these webinars, courts and tribunals are likely to be much more sympathetic to employers who have adopted the core principles of seeking to be fair and reasonable with their staff and who have communicated and explained their rationale. There is scope for employers to tailor their solutions and not be too rigid in their approach to returning to work. So what about where employees don't want to return to work? Well, speak to them and try and understand and address the concerns they have about returning to work. Again, the more lead in time, the better. An employee can be dismissed or not paid for coming to work because of COVID-19. 
but if the employee reasonably believes that the threat is serious and imminent, and then it cannot reasonably be controlled, then any dismissal would potentially be automatically unfair, and the employee may be able to claim compensation for any punishment, such as the non-payment of wages. So, as explained, care should be taken in relation to people in these circumstances or who are vulnerable or pregnant. Finally, on the point of um, bringing workers back and the question of travelling to and from work, employers do not normally need to assess their employees' methods of travelling to and from work. However, in light of the current pandemic, it appears that the protection obligations do extend to employees travelling to and from work. So that if the employee reasonably believes that a commute would place them at serious and imminent danger, they may be able to refuse to travel to and from work. So employers are encouraged to be sympathetic to the risks associated with travel and facilitate working from home where possible, particularly for city workers. And again, it comes back to that point of being flexible and being creative depending on your individual workforce. Richard. Thanks, Alex. So remote working will still be encouraged for some time after initial restrictions are lifted. The first issue is, of course, whether your business is able to facilitate remote working. For those that can, some workers may embrace the opportunity to spend more time at home and less time traveling, while others may complain about the lack of a clear demarcation between home life and work and a consequent increase in stress. Recent research papers note that many of the direct consequences of the pandemic, for example, bereavement, unemployment, homelessness, and the indirect consequences caused by lockdown and social distancing measures, such as increased social isolation and loneliness, are key risk factors for mental health issues. It's therefore important to remember that employers have statutory and common law duties to ensure the health and safety of their workers, including physical and mental health, as far as, as is reasonably practicable. The employer's duty is to take steps to eliminate identified risks if it is reasonably practicable to do so. What is reasonably practicable will depend on the circumstances and the degree of risk in a particular job or workplace balanced against the time, trouble, cost and physical difficulty of taking measures to avoid or reduce that risk. The duty extends to risks arising from the workplace, how the employer conducts the undertaking, supervision, training, instruction or lack thereof, the plant, equipment, materials and or substances used, and the condition of the premises and provision of welfare facilities. Securing a safe working environment equivalent to that found in the workplace will often require extensive checks of equipment and the working environment and the adjustment of or replacement of work equipment. Many employees will resent this intrusion into their home environment and feel that questions about their home are an unwanted breach of privacy. The size and scope of the company's operation, its resources and the demands it faces are relevant in deciding what is reasonable. In deciding whether an employer has been negligent in causing an employee psychiatric injury, the employer's actions and omissions will be compared with those of a hypothetical reasonable employer in consideration given to whether the psychiatric injury, loss or damage was reasonably foreseeable. An employer must take steps to protect the employee from an occurrence or recurrence of the psychiatric illness, taking into account the magnitude of the risk, the cost of preventing it and the effectiveness, effectiveness if taking of such steps. Practical steps employees can take to support the mental health of staff include maintaining connection with them. This can be done by phone or via video calling and is even more important if staff are working remotely. Encouraging staff to switch off, reminding them that they're not expected to be at work 24 seven and to take some time for exercise, rest and relaxation. Consulting with staff to understand the effective change, uh, effect changing working patterns is having on them and adapting policies and procedures accordingly. Reminding staff that they are still part of a team can help prevent feelings of isolation and loneliness and help maintain team morale. Being honest with staff about the impacts coronavirus is having on the organisation, what you intend to do to minimise those impacts and how they might be affected by any plans making sure any communications for staff are clear and easy to understand and making sure all managers are briefed in advance to answer any questions staff may ask as a result and lastly reminding staff of the available support for example how to get help from hr or how to access any confidential counseling helpline so one of the likely impacts of covid19 
is its effect as a catalyst in the shift in attitude towards remote working and smart working practices. While a lot of employers may, may embrace changes to working patterns and accelerated move towards hot desking, some organisations will expect workers to return to their site once the lockdown is lifted. This may well lead to increased flexible working requests for permanent home working arrangements. Without going into detail on this webinar, where an employee with a minimum of 26 weeks service makes such a request, there will only be limited circumstances in which a request can be refused. As such, employees may wish to begin to plan to consider viability of whether roles can be performed remotely as a more permanent arrangement. In terms of managing performance, Staff working remotely should be appraised like any other workers. They might be concerned that managers or colleagues suspect that they, suspect that they work less or less effectively than workplace-based colleagues. So some thought should be given to how the employee will measure the quality and quantity of the home workers output. A suitable reporting and appraisal system should be agreed, building in sufficient opportunity for reviews and work progress, involvement in projects, levels of performance, expectations, and any difficulties that either the home worker or their manager consider should be addressed. Workers should not be denied promotional prospects merely because they are currently working at home all or part of the time. There may indeed be good reasons why such workers cannot be promoted to a particular position, but employees will have to show that a decision can be objectively justified if, for example, a discrimination claim is brought. Thanks, Alex. More muting issues there. Um, thank you, Richard, and thank you everyone for joining today's session. We know we've run over slightly by two minutes, um, but thank you for attending. Uh, we appreciate it. it's a whistle-stop tour through some of the considerations, but we hope you found it useful. Um, as mentioned, all of our sessions are recorded. We can be found on our website and YouTube channel. Um, there are a couple of questions which remain unanswered, um, so we will follow those up individually after this webinar. But if you'd like to raise any further questions or you want to dis discuss this topic in more detail, then please feel free to email either Richard or me at alexwatson at fieldfisher.com and richard.branson at fieldfisher.com. In the meantime, keep safe and we hope you can join us for our next uh, webinar on redundancy processes during and after furlough. And the dates for the future webinars can be found on the slide. Thank you very much indeed for attending.